Cool, thank you for having me uh, at Meta Refresh. Uh, it's been so far a really great journey. Like, uh, thanks to Zainab and the whole team, like, they made it really, really straightforward and nice for me to come here and be here in Bangalore, India, for the first time. So, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Thomas. I, I want to talk to you about real-time communication a little, um, specifically on the web platform. Um, he, I just was introduced already quite nicely, but just to give you a little background on what the hell is this white face on stage. Um, I'm a web developer since 98, 97, 98. I started to do my first website, and I'm actually more or less a UX designer. That's where I come from, and I only learned coding because I wanted to create cool stuff for other people, and that was the way to do it. Uh, I organized JSConf and CSSConf in uh, Singapore, and I did it once in Manila. Uh, so far, very popular conferences. Uh, maybe you can make it out at some point. Uh, and I help a lot of startups at JFTI, and uh, even here in Bangalore, I got uh, the opportunity to talk to a few startups in the last days, and it was actually quite a cool experience. So the last year, I spent a lot of time helping developers uh, dealing with the technology a web standard that is since 1st of April, in large parts, finally a web standard, a recommendation by the W3C called WebRTC. And this talk is essentially about everything that I learned about it and everything that my team did uh, to help developers deal with WebRTC and make it usable a lot easier. So we're going to go into the opportunities a little bit, what it can enable, what it can do, how it performs, where it works, all these kind of things. I want to start a little bit with a bit of history into communication, just so you see what WebRTC actually enables real-time communication, to be exact. Now, what I'm doing right now to all of you is real-time communication, too, right? Like, it's pretty real-time. Uh, pretty low latency, too, I hope. Um, this, in a way, is real-time communication. And as a UX designer, this is also the ideal user experience, is to talk to somebody that is actually competent and helpful and ideally speaks your language uh, that can solve problems for you. Like, this is how most problems were solved 50, 100 years ago, right? You would go somewhere and you would talk to somebody and they would help you. So this is what we are all trying to mimic with technology in a way. Now, in this talk, I want to specifically talk about real-time telecommunication, meaning there is so much distance between two people that you cannot do it in a person-to-person -person scenario, right? So what does that mean? Where does it come from? And how did it work quite a while back? So this is 1872 and like, telecommunication was a service. It was like, and in large parts of India, I hear it actually still is, it's an office that you go to, and then you talk to somebody, and then they would type it into a device, and then it gets sent through a cable from London to the US or something, and there sits somebody on the other side that reads out what happened, the data that came from that cable. So this is how it all started, right? Telecommunication. It's a service. Now, over the time, it progressed a little. Right? It became a thing, something that you can actually hold and interact with. And to a lot of people these days, it is still a thing. You know, looking at how people use their smartphones these days, which in general are literally general computing devices, they can do anything. But most people use them, for example, specifically for messaging. It's not that you can't message on a computer. Obviously, you can, but, but for a lot of people, oh, it's WhatsApp, like that's on my phone. If my battery dies there can't communicate anymore. So it's still a, a little bit in our head that communication is a device. It's something that you walk over in the corner and dial numbers, scratch numbers in, and then somebody will hopefully pick up. Now, since 2003, I think Skype really made it popular. That was the breakthrough of communications as a software on general computing machines. So suddenly, smartphones and laptops and all these kind of things can host communication as an app as a software. This is already pretty cool, meaning you get into this general computing environment. Now, 2015 changes that again, and you can see where I'm going to. WebRTC is a web standard since 1st of April, finally, was a lot of effort and time to get to it. And WebRTC is a set of JavaScript APIs in the browser to enable peer-to-peer -peer communication. And that's a big deal. It's not that there was no embedded communication before. You know, technologies like Flash and others were able to do this kind of stuff before, but 
you know, nobody likes plugins, they were proprietary, so not as open, and there's something about web standards that make them last long. Even the web today is still as popular, as, even more popular, obviously, as it ever used to be. And it is largely because it is a standard, meaning it is something that a lot of people agreed on doing in a certain way. And that has a lot of power and a lot of long, -liv long livity. Um, it literally goes over century, um, sorry, tens of years so far. Right? HTML was, I think, invented somewhere end of the 80s. So, so much about standards, right? Compare this to Symbian, proprietary software. It goes away with companies being suddenly unsuccessful. Now, this is how the web works usually. This is how pretty much every web interaction, a huge amount of them, work. You have peers, you have consumers, you have people in front of their devices and these other circles, and they talk to a server somewhere, and then that server relays information to other people. Right? Like, I call this the star, star setup, right? Forms a little star to the server. Now, this is how WebRTC looks. Everybody to everybody. You know, crazy. So you see already a few things, right? Every peer has a higher set of connections that they need to maintain because it's a connection to everybody that wants to connect to them, and there's suddenly no authority or entity anymore that regulates anything. It can just go mad, right? Talk to everybody. If you want to send a message to three people, you need to send it through three different network connections. So that's peer-to-peer. Now, what can peer-to-peer -peer technology be used for? Right? And these are some of the use cases that are specifically enabled by WebRTC. WebRTC comes, besides its peer-to-peer -peer setup, with a set of uh, APIs that allow you to access microphone and camera of your devices. And with those, you can do one-on-one -on -one calling, conferencing, in-game chatting, virtual co-working, music streaming. Like, actually, we have an intern at the office that just built a karaoke app, which is kind of cool. Um, sensor data exchange, video consultations, even conferences. Like, I attended a conference entirely done through WebRTC. This is how web communication used to work in the last years. Type in somebody's phone number that you read from a website. It's not really that online. Installing Skype and exchanging usernames or inviting somebody on Hangout. So WebRTC can change all of that. These are some of the scenarios that WebRTC can enable, and th those are just the ones that I came up with or some of our customers actually do. Talk to your host. You booked an Airbnb or something on TravelMob, and you want to talk to the guy that you actually rented from, right? Instead of typing in a phone number, do it through the app. You buy something on Flipkart, and you have a question to the seller in the marketplace offer. I, they don't want to share the phone number. It's a privacy thing sometimes. Um, and they can control and actually see that you made that call and how long that call was. They can't look into the call, they don't have access to that, but they can see the duration and other things. Might help them with conversion rate, optimization, and other things, right? Now, in a short, WebRTC enables embedded contextual communication. Like communication, audio communication, even video communication, or just data exchange where you need it, directly to other consumers, to other peers. Those can be servers too, actually. This is where we're at. In 2015, WebRTC makes communication a feature. It's not a software anymore. It's not an app that you go to. It's wherever you need it. Today in WhatsApp, you can call. Facebook, you can call. And these are just communications tools that think it's another form of communication. But yeah, you can put it into Ola or Uber and call your driver. Right. So this is how WebRTC works conceptually. Right? We have WebRTC, and I introduced the concept of signaling here, meaning there's an authority somehow that does all the introductionary services for you so that two people can actually get to know each other. It works a little bit like a LinkedIn introduction or something. So you have a known party, and both of these peers, A and B, know this known party. They connect to it. And because they have a certain token that they both have in common, the known party knows, oh, these guys want to talk to each other, so I'm going to introduce them, and then they can exchange information directly. You can see already the dashed lines. There's very little information that is actually transmitted to the known party. It's literally introductory, introduction. And the data, the heavyweight, goes directly peer-to-peer. -peer. 
So five things that make working with WebRTC incredibly difficult today, and I go through how we try to solve them um, with the product suite that we call Skylink. Um, on the client side, do you want to create a website that actually leverages WebRTC? To do that, you need to do this. And that's like extended from what you find on the web that we did this company internally. This was like our working draft to figure out how the hell do we get started with this. So it's a bit older already. Um, I'll just go through the high level stuff. Uh, and on the top, it introduces the, the flow of information that goes between the signaling server, the caller, and the callee. Uh, and you have an exchange of candidates, which are network addresses and ports to which the different peers can connect to. And you have an, um, kind of a negotiation of the video and audio codecs that the different browsers support. So it's like a LinkedIn introduction happening through the signaling server, you know, through a third party. And then the first question you ask is, hey, do you speak English? Kind of the same way. All of this is done in Skylink.js. So you, a lot of you used to, to pick up the stickers yesterday already, which is very cool. <laughs> it's like, oh, a new sticker. I want that. Um, this is what Skylink.js does. Right? Skylink.js is all of that that you saw before on the client side done for you. Now, WebRTC today works in these three browsers, but there are subtle differences in it. It's a young standard. It's still shifting massively. Like every browser version that comes out has something new for WebRTC currently. And it's pretty hard to keep the track of that. And uh, if you maintain a WebRTC implementation yourself, you will constantly need to adapt. Well, luckily, we do this for you. So we have a project, Adopter.js, that Skylink is also built on top of that shims all the different implementations in different browsers for you so that it becomes equally easy to use in every browser. It also actually takes care of some helping functions where we thought, hey, this is a bit complicated to use. Let's put a function in there so it becomes easier. And it polyfills. And it polyfills because of this. WebRTC doesn't work in those browsers yet. Or it doesn't. So our company created a little plugin. It's not the greatest experience. You know, it's not, again, we are back to installing Flash or something, right? But at least it enables those browsers to support WebRTC. Uh, and we're working on the experience right now. I just got an email this morning where my colleague wrote me, hey, I found a way where I don't need to force people to restart the browser after installing. So it's getting better and better. Um, and these work on Mac and Windows so that even IE9 is suddenly working with WebRTC. Now, coming to the server side, problem number two. To, you need to create this known party, the signaling server, right? So you need at least some kind of instance, like a lot of people use Amazon AWS for it. Uh, obviously, you need to maintain it, you need to pay for it, there come costs with it. Uh, you need to adopt it to exactly the message exchange that you have implemented on the client side so that, you know, the, they understand each other. Um, and obviously, it should be low latency because you want to have this introduction as fast as possible. So we have a service for this, a backend as a service that does that. You can sign up for it. It's currently free. That does all of that for you. It works, obviously, seemingly together with Skylink.js so that when you use it, you don't the only thing that you need to enter is an API key, and it will connect. Now, so this is something that Pete Hunt, the guy that created React, said at some point in his talk in Manila at my conference. And he was like, if it doesn't work on mobile, it's not worth doing. And it's obviously in India more true than anywhere else. Um, it works already in Android on the same browsers, and I'll show that in a moment. And on top of that, we thought we'd throw in some SDKs for good measure so that you can actually work with it on iOS and native apps, and on Android and native apps too, and you can connect those. You can connect from an Android app and make a call to somebody on the browser. It's no problem. And then there are a lot of edge cases. WebRTC is a very weird technology. It depends on so many moving parts to work just right to be able to get a good connection. And that is obviously your bandwidth, the latency. Where is the signaling server? Is it close by? How fast is your phone? I mean, because you're dealing with audio and video codecs, there's encoding and encrypting going on. You know, it all limits how good your application, uh, sorry, your phone can actually deal with connections. Can it do five connections, video connections? Can it do, like we've gone up to six on a very modern HTC phone. 
uh, that you, but then the screen gets a bit small actually. You know, can't see six people anymore so well. Um, so there are a lot of edge cases, and the most common ones are are these two that uh, a lot of specifically enterprise customers have firewalls that actually don't let in peer-to-peer -peer connections. This kind of hole punching that um, your routers at home allow is usually turned off in enterprise systems. And then the second one was what I referred to, is CPU and bandwidth are just not there just yet, specifically on mobile. And in those cases, you can use services that we provide and make it a bit easier for you. Like, they increase the quality of service of connection establishment between peers because they help identifying a way to bring those peers together. Stun does that from the outside looking at your phone, and turn does that by being a relay server, meaning you actually don't allow, it's not peer-to-peer -peer anymore at that moment, uh, but you can make a video call, and it's going through a server. So the latency will be slightly higher, depending on where that server is, then location is really important again, um, but it is possible. And the SFU is a funky thing, Think of a conversation that you have with four other people, meaning your computer sends out four videos to four people and receives four videos from four people. So it's eight connections. It's eight videos to encode and encrypt and decode, decrypt. That's a lot of work for a CPU. And the SFU essentially reduces this. So you send out only one video. The SFU forwards that to everybody. That reduces the amount of connections in that specific situation to five. So you have three connections that you don't have to deal with, meaning the performance goes up, bandwidth requirement goes down, meaning you have a better experience. Now, to the interesting part. How does that all work? Does it work in India? The big test. Um, I have a lot of links in this uh, that you can check out yourself as well, and I'm going to show you a few of those, uh, just so that you, you know how it works or not. Let's see. So this is Skylink IO. This is where you can sign up to get your API key and actually use Skylink. And this is a tech demo that we did. And it's maybe the most common WebRTC demo that people share. So this is a little website that allows you to just call a friend. You send him a link. He clicks on the link. He's going to a website. And suddenly, he's in a call with you. So I'll enter a specific address here. You can put just whatever behind the slash to create a custom room. So I do that. Now my computer will ask me for camera and microphone access, so I should stand here. I'll grant that. And let's see, who is there? Hmm. Now, ooh, somebody's in the room. Who could that be? It's me. Hello. Hello. Oh, feedback. So you can see that actually works, and it's not too bad. You know, like the, the magic here is obviously it's peer to peer, right? Meaning I don't go through the internet at all. Both my devices have a connection to this signaling server, but it's only used for messaging, meaning the requirements on bandwidth are as low as you can possibly be. And somebody already knows how it works. Feel free to come on stage, whoever you are. Show your face. There you go. So you see, like, you don't need to install anything. There are two billion devices already shipped in the, on this planet that support WebRTC and have a camera and microphone to do this. Um, do we get one more? Anybody with an Android phone or Mac or Windows computer on Chrome, Firefox, Opera can join. The room name is iOS because I'm, you know, lazy and don't want to type much. And I wanted it. This is, by the way, the iOS app. Uh, a demo app that we created to show how SDK works. There we go, we have a fourth person. Nope, we don't. But you can see how the peer-to-peer -peer nature of this technolo technology is uh, allowing for great performance, because it finds the shortest route to the other peer through the internet. And specifically in, in India, where I hear a lot of people complaining about the fact Hi. Uh, complaining about the fact <laughs> that uh, the peering here is pretty bad and that servers are so expensive in India and you always rather, ugh, now you killed it. <laughs> By the way, this is working in Safari, right? Which natively doesn't support WebRTC, so it uses our plugin to enable all of that. 
Well, you really killed it. Fantastic. OK, more examples. Let's see if we can kill my Chrome, too. So this is a little co-working app that I created. Um, it's serverless, meaning it only uses our infrastructure, and everything is done peer-to-peer. -peer. It asks me for access to my camera and microphone, and then asks me, hey, you know, thanks, may I know your name? And I say, yo, I'm Thomas. Now I'm entering a room. And this feels a bit like Slack or HipChat or whatever company internal messenger or chat system you use. But I have a picture up here that updates every five seconds. Right? Or if I click the picture. So if anybody else goes to that same URL, you'll pop up on the side. Right? So you can see my entire team sitting there. We tried this out with up to 12 people. It takes a lot of CPU from then on forward because it's sadly not that optimized in the browser side just yet, but it works. Uh, and I hear the audio as well, meaning you get this kind of feeling you're in a co-working cafe where there are a lot of people around you and there's a little bit of noise in the background. And you can talk to your coworkers and you can share pictures. Like, let's see if there's a picture about meta refresh and Flickr by just typing share meta refresh. And I'm sure the picture will be very creepy. Let's see? There you go, meta refresh just straight from Flickr. So like, there's a bit more functionality. You can mute and unmute yourself. And one of the cool things is, uh, I don't know if you see this. I, maybe I move, zoom in here a little. The picture actually blurs as soon as I leave the tab. So that whenever you're not really looking at this tab, like, you get a bit of privacy. People can't see if you're in front of your computer, but they can't see what you're doing. In the same way, if I leave the tab, the audio goes down. So I'm not distracted by other conversations that are happening in the chat. Only if I go back to the tab, I will actually hear full volume again. So this whole thing, this whole application was written on top of Skylink, and only Skylink. There's no jQuery, no React, no Backbone, no nothing. It uses Skylink, and I use a helper library here to do the blurring and grayscale conversion of pictures um, that I scraped from Stack Overflow, essentially. And this whole thing is 420 lines of code. With HTML, I put the JavaScript even in the same file. I didn't care about making this an include or anything. It's really tiny. It doesn't have a server side. It saves my chat history and local storage. So whatever you witnessed is replayed when you enter the room again. It's really, really straightforward. So you can write these kind of serverless, lightweight applications that use distributed storage to maintain state. It's not as straightforward as it sounds, but you can. Another example that I hope works, it depends always on how good. Oh, hi, Rashnikant. Isn't that an actor? <laughs> Just checking. So let's see. Now that looks good. This is another th stupid thing that I wrote. And uh, this is a selfie remote. Like, I come from Asia, like the real Asia. <laughs> And people there use selfie sticks to take like fancy pictures of them in front of ridiculous backgrounds. Um, and once you put your phone on the selfie stick, like you have one problem, like a big one, which is you can't reach the photo button anymore. And now there are Bluetooth solutions and like even like mechanical fingers that tap and all this kind of stuff. I thought I'd create a WebRTC solution for that. So I visit a website on my phone that is already here, and uh, I need to have the same public IP address from my laptop, which I hope is the case, otherwise I won't be introduced, because I use the public IP address of this internet connection as the room identifier so that our signaling server knows, OK, two people with the same IP address are going to introduce those two to each other. And I just hope that works. Here it says waiting for remote. Here it says waiting for phone. So that tells me, like, do you load balance over multiple connections? Uh, OK. And then you have session stickiness. OK, then that's not going to work. Uh, meaning my Android phone has a different public IP address than my laptop, so I, I would need to hack it now. Right, but my other device is iOS. So there, the website doesn't work yet. Right? Oh, yeah, sure. If you want, you can go on your Android phone to this address, but you need to add phone.html behind it. Um, maybe I can actually show it to you just in two tabs instead of on two devices. You get the gist. 
So here I visit the phone. Please share access to your camera, if you let me. Come on, Google. Yes, hello. So here is my picture, right? And this happen runs on the phone. I'll put this here on the right side. Why not? And this happens here on the left side. So I see a video stream of myself being transferred to my other device, right, that I would hold secretly under the picture. Um, and I can capture a picture. And so I use WebRTC to uh, load the preview over. So this is a video stream. And that picture is actually not taken out of the video stream on this side, but it is captured in full resolution on a JavaScript canvas on the phone and then saved as a JPEG and sent over via the data channel of WebRTC to the other side. So I have a high resolution picture here, although the preview can be really pixelated and shitty connection. It's also an advantage because the video streams are optimized for low latency, meaning if the codecs figure out their shitty connection, they reduce the frame rate and sometimes the resolution too. So the video favors low latency and real time over quality of the video, right? So it's more important that you see things moving and you hear each other, no matter how crappy, because you can't just buffer. It's like really bad in a conversation where you get stuck and then eventually continue. Not that helpful. But the data channel transfer can go very, very slowly. So it can take like a minute to transfer the full resolution picture from the phone back to your other device, right? But you don't care. You just want the full resolution pi picture. You want the quality. You don't want it as fast as possible. So this is like, I think, using the right tool for the right problem. Taking selfies. So we got that covered with WebRTC. Very important. Here's an interesting one. So for those people that work with React, um, we have a React Sync. React is awesome. It brings state back to the web. In the 90s, there was always this one URL is one website. Right? And whenever you open the same URL, you get the same website. Eventually, all this like Perl, PHP, and server-side dynamic languages came up, and it was not true anymore because personalization and all this kind of stuff. Now with React, there's suddenly state again on the client side, meaning you have the same state in your app, it will render the same way. Now we can actually use that really well to connect to peers via WebRTC. And I have a little demo running here on my local host with this, just to show you how that works. I visit the same website on both sides, and this website, oh, actually before I do this, this website just uh, renders whatever I type into the text box on the left, it renders in Markdown on the right, so I can like, you know, do links and all that kind of shit. <coughs> Sorry. Rather straightforward. It's a very, very small React component. If I open this in a new tab, here's what will happen. They connect via WebRTC. It's two lines of code that I added to this React component. It's a React mixin that I wrote called React WebRTC Sync. You add an API key from Skylink and a room identifier. And now, one, one side will send the state over to the other side. So when I keep writing here, and I make maybe a headline, oh, come on. Oh, wait. If I haven't used this in a while, I better start over. And depending on the quality of the internet connection, ah, here we go. So you can see how on the other side, it renders the exact same way. And that's, you know, that's not going through a server and like doing another set of persistency. Like all it sends over is the visual state. React only is a DOM rendering engine, so it's not really a JavaScript framework that does all the server communication and so on. So it's just for DOM rendering, meaning it's really just what you see. It's like screen sharing, but instead of sending pixel data, it sends a JSON object, right? Yeah. So it can be much, much faster, and because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's super low latency. Like, it can't get faster, literally. And you can do product demos with it, right? If, you ha if your app is entirely written in React, try out in every component, you add these two lines of code to enable it for sync, and then you visit the same website on another browser, and whatever you do in one side will happen on the other side. Right, that's pretty cool, I thought. 
Like we have a lot more of these demos. I have a demo where I build a, a web component, like we had this talk earlier, that essentially enables you to do a call. So it's one tag. I call it Skylink call tag. You put your app key in here. Call ID is who you are. Caller name is your name. Callee ID is who you want to call. And callee name is the name of the person you want to call. You can put as many buttons of this as you want on your website and style them however you want. And I show you the little demo here as well. It's a massive website, so you'll see this. It's crazy, the complexity and the design. Let's see if the internet doesn't let me down. Maybe I reconnect really quick. No, it doesn't want me right now. So all this website gives you is like a button. One says call Alice and the other one call, says call Bob. If I click them, what will happen is that uh, there will be a video rendered in the lower right corner. And as soon as the other side picks up, there's going to be a pop-up message saying, hey, Alice is calling. Do you want to take that call? And if you say, OK, it's going to establish a video call. And it's one HTML tag that you add uh, done with Polymer. We heard the talk before. would love to show it, but I don't seem to be too lucky. Well, so far, everything went well. There you go. It's just pretty slow. So I think this all is Skylink. Uh, you find more on, like all these demos are linked on this page uh, from Get a Room over the co-working chat, the selfie demo, React Sync. There are tutorials on how to build a simple messaging service that just does chat and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It works with your phones. Uh, we're going to have the karaoke app in the store soon where it uses your local Wi-Fi to turn every phone into a microphone so that everybody has a microphone and can sing. And if the website that is the master control, you get like for every phone that's connected a little volume slide so you can mute people that sing really bad. You know, it's a funky little app. There's no real purpose behind it other than being fun and like trying out what you can do with low latency WebRTC. And it uses the same kind of thing where the public IP address is your room identifier, so only people in the same Wi-Fi will be connected. Um, so you don't need to worry about some creep from somewhere suddenly singing with you. That is what it is. So that's Skylink. This is like the real-time communications working on mobile and Android, and I hope I can uh, give you one last inspiration on where WebRTC can be going. Now, like I said, the problems in India with connectivity and service are outside much cheaper and so on. You want low latency wherever possible. Like speed is the biggest engagement driver on the internet. And that's not entirely true. Speed is the second biggest engagement driver on the internet. It's only surpassed by perceived speed. But that's a whole different talk. Um, to achieve that, you can use WebRTC in every classroom scenario teacher wants to show somebody on the student's app. Why go to a server somewhere in California, or at least Singapore, and come back through the same internet connection to the students to update whatever it is you're doing? Specifically, if the data gets media heavy, really use WebRTC for that. It creates the same connection between two devices right away on the same Wi-Fi. You get two milliseconds maximum latency, because that's how good Wi-Fi is. Um, you can't beat that. Right? And even on a country scale, like if you know your servers are somewhere really remotely located, you can load uh, big content data, you can load states if they are distributedly stored, or even search results. Like there's a guy in California who implements uh, BitTorrent currently as a website. So you could essentially go to a website and it will stream videos from other people just like you visiting the same website. No app installed, no need for it. So how cool is that? And I think with that, the web can be a very different place 10 years from now, where we rely less of, on service and uh, much more on each other. Um, I would carefully call it the democratization of the connectivity, if you will, uh, and I hope that catches on. It also will surpass a lot of the NSA and surveillance problems that we have, because every peer-to-peer -peer connection is the shortest route possible. That's how the internet works, meaning it will, ha sorry, it will have less surface area to servers anywhere. 
so there's less opportunity to take that data out, and then it's still encrypted by default. So that makes conversations happening peer-to-peer -peer very, very private. I think that's something to strive for. So thank you for your time. And questions, obviously. Uh, hi, Thomas. Hi. Uh, so I used to work in a VoIP and cloud communication company. Yeah. So I've been working with WebRTC for the last one and a half, two years. Yeah. So we implemented a WebRTC click-to-call widget, a Chrome extension which lets you make calls between each other. But, and yeah. because it was VoIP, we integrated with our existing VoIP gateways. Yeah. So our main uh, problem happened when you have a client with uh, multiple virtual networks, network adapters, yeah. and the ICE negotiation would take a long, long time. Because yeah. the, it would take up to five or six seconds. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you must have faced the same problem. What's your take on that? How did well, you? Well, so WebRTC these days supports trickle ICE, which essentially sends whatever port and uh, IP combination it can find that works as fast as it can find it. Um, that, in 90% of the cases, solves that problem. Uh, but it cannot always solve that problem. Like, that's one of the problems. There are timeouts involved to, for network interface lookups and all this stuff uh, that you can only surround that good. So if a firewall or a network is badly configured, there's not much you can do. Um, the best thing you can do is use trickle eyes. I tried doing that, but when I read up last, they were talking about just using the most the active adapter, or the one which was used last, and then rely on that, because if you're using something like VMware and stuff like that, sure. it just yeah. goes deep inside and it's in a hole that's not coming that's back. That's correct. You can obviously, want, after you have successfully established one connection, you can cache the candidate and send that with a priority. Any, that can any, work. Uh, any plans on growing this and connecting to the existing phone system? So let's say you're doing this across... Like Many plans, yes. I can't, I can't say much about the progress of it just yet. Um, it's going well, but that's all I can say. Uh, but it, it, it will come, yeah. But I hear it also, somebody told me that calling from a um, general computing machine to a phone number is actually illegal in India. Um, no, it's not we were doing it. We're still doing it. Oh, okay. So here you see the demo finally working, right? We saw the call happening and now Alice and Bob can finally talk to each other. Um, that's the web component. More questions. OK, you're all blown away. Well, go to Skylink, sign up, get an API key. That's great. I love it. Ha catch me later outside. I actually thought I'll take a lightning talk later as well, where we'll go a little bit about this whole, do I do an app, do I do a mobile website um, thing? Like, just to throw in more gasoline on the fire. Um, 